all your hard work. My apologies for my comments earlier on. How could I doubt my brother? And we are greatly enriched by having Jamie and Di and Alexis here with us. Good on you uh, for all the work you do. Now you've got to put up with me and I wouldn't be surprised if Jamie turned my microphone down. <laughs> it wouldn't make any difference. No, it wouldn't. In fact, I'm going to talk about that. There you go. Later on. Okay, but it doesn't make any difference at all, does it? Anybody listening out there? Yes. We better pray, haven't we? We better pray. Let's seek the Lord. We want you to speak to each one of us, not just me here in the pulpit, but you. I want you to speak to me too. And but every one of us here in this room, let your voice be heard, and let our faith be edified, built up, strengthened. And uh, may we be driven on to serve you better. We come in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, I've got some handouts of you guys have been handed out. Good. And I think I did about 25 of them. May have to share. I don't know. But uh, see how we go. I get... Uh, have at the top of my notes here that we are having a prayer time after church and on the back of that sheet that you are uh, handed out that you are receiving are some suggestions for our prayer time after morning tea. If you've never been to a prayer meeting here at Living Hope, today is your chance to join in one. Uh, I've been to prayer meetings that have been rather dull and rather difficult. Uh, but prayer is hard work, let's face it. It is a work that we are called to do. It's a discipline. Uh, but I try to keep our prayer meetings lively and brief and to the point, and we'll try to do that today. We've been talking about Joseph. Thank you, Michael. That have been excellent uh, sermons on the life of Joseph. Innocently imprisoned in an Egyptian prison probably didn't have a hot shower every day. Obviously there wasn't a razor in sight because when he was released he had to have a shave and get into new clothes. And a lot of that, at least two years of that, was because the cupbearer forgot to tell Pharaoh that an innocent man was in prison. Well, we tend to blame the cupbearer, but let's face it, who's God around here? God could have opened the prison doors at any moment, as he did for Peter in the New Testament. Mind you, a couple of days beforehand, James was beheaded. The same God was God of both circumstances. So how do we live with a God who is a super reigning God, but still allows hurtful things, very hurtful things to happen? Well, I was uh, thinking about this even this morning and thinking, well, to believe in God, to believe in this God, this super reigning God, is hazardous for us all. But it is also a heart lifting because without that same God, life is hopeless and there is no eternity to hope for. So uh, that's our choice to believe in God and find life circumstances sometimes being rather hazardous. There's a room full of people here today who could do with some answers to prayer, whether it be family matters, physical matters, emotional matters, you name it. We are suffering from any number of those things. And God doesn't seem to do anything about it uh, just as he didn't seem to do anything about it for poor old Joseph left languishing another two years in an Egyptian jail. But wow, what happened when Joseph got out? Well, the next, the rest of his life was a life of palace living. And I guess that's the hope we have, that God is on our side, he's working things out. Uh, but it's all to do with the, this mystery of predestination, and I won't go into that now. But to uh, set the scene for this morning, I just want to read uh, a uh, preface, not a preface, it's a word from a book that I've been reading called The Power.
Paradigm by Jonathan Kahn. I was at pre meeting last year, and this was a preview, a pre book on coffee tables, and uh, we could take it home, and I did. And I looked at it, and I thought, oh, maybe, maybe. Uh, but then Janet, Janet Warren gave us a book to read called The Oracle. This is a 40 page summary of it. It's a 280 page book, but it's an easy read and it's riveting stuff page by page. But I just want to read something to set the scene from The Paradigm, page 21 and 22. Just a paragraph. There was a time when though many people had transgressed God's standards, there was still an understanding that such things were transgressions. They knew they had sinned. One could break the law, but one realized that one was a lawbreaker. But now all that has changed. Talking about modern America particularly, uh, but the Western world in general, all that has now changed. It was no longer a matter of transgressing standards or breaking the law. Now those standards themselves have been overturned. Before this, pagan practices were performed in secret. Now they're performed in the public square. Pagan morality now became the nation's governing morality. That's the world we're living in. That's the Western world we're living in. And the paradigm is all about comparing the days of Ahab, Jezebel, and their son Joram with Bill and Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama. That era in American politics and the downward spiral uh, of uh, morals and ethics. So that what was once considered wrong, a transgression, is now considered legally the thing to do. That's the, set, the, the scene set. This is where we're going. Talking about that in the context of the sovereignty of God. And of course it all started way, way back in the days of Adam and Eve. Anybody remember Adam and Eve? Well, of course, we read about them when we read our Bibles, the second chapter and the third chapter in particular. And Adam and Eve succumbed to the temptation to do wrong in the eyes of God. And they paid a hefty price. Since then, of course, there was Cain. There was uh, the people that drowned in the flood. There was Babel. There was Israel. And the list goes on. Sin continues to be sin, and sin seems to get worse rather than better as time goes on. Well, let me single out the nation of Israel in particular. And we remember that they were, if we read the Old Testament kings, they were taken into exile, 722 BC, for Israel, the main nation, but 597 B.C. for Judah. God has something very special and poignant to say about uh, Israel in particular, and the nations should all listen, because what happens to Israel is also pertinent to the nations as well. And if we read chapter 28 of Deuteronomy, we will see that it starts off with the blessings for those who obey God's word. If you obey him, keep on his side, keep seeking him, he will look after you in this fallen world. Yes, there may still be hazards, there may still be things going wrong. There may still be Joseph, the innocent Joseph, thrown into jail. And you've got a picture of a, an attractive young uh, Iranian woman, a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, who is, as we speak, in prison now, simply because she believed. But by and large, blessings are promised, and I trust that she is experiencing the blessing of the Lord in her soul. 
But cursed shall be those who disobeyed the Lord, verses 15 onwards. And that's quite a list and quite a descriptive list of what's going to happen if you uh, push the Lord into the backdrop of your life. And I single out verses 62 and 63 in particular. Then you shall be left few in number, whereas you were a num as numerous as the stars of heaven, because you did not obey the Lord your God. It shall come about that as the Lord delighted over you to prosper you and multiply you, so the Lord will delight over you to make you perish and to destroy you, and you will be torn from the land where you are entering to possess it. Verse 64, Moreover, the Lord will scatter you among all peoples from one end of the earth to the other end, and there shall, you shall serve other gods there, wood and stone which you or your fathers have not known. Quite a severe consequence of not believing the Lord. In fact, that word curse, well, we, we are familiar with the word blessing, the Hebrew word blessing. Anybody know it? Bar Barak. And uh, even one of the United States presidents had that as his first name, didn't he? Barack Obama. Uh, was he a blessing to America? Well, he should have been. But the name simply means to, uh, to find the abundance of God's treasures, to be endowed, to have his smile on your life. What about the curse? And the word I looked up was halal, halala. And uh, I thought about that and I thought, oh yeah, yeah, we, we learned that in Arabic. It means to be small, to be, uh, to have little, not to have much at all, to be sharp, to be uh, harsh, to be thought little of. And so God pushes those who disbelieve Him away. Those who believe him and uh, obey him see the smile of his face and understand. But those who don't are made small, humble, if you like. And so it was. Uh, I have been talking to you at the communion table about the word Jubilee and Leviticus 25, uh, where you know, every 50 years, on the 49th year, a... Um, a, a trumpeter sound and uh, anybody who had given up their land uh, for whatever reason for, to pay a debt could have that land returned to them, restored uh, uh, in the 50th year. Well, it's a kind of a jubilee principle in reverse that I'm talking about this morning because in May 67, something very dramatic and very horrendous happened in the land of Palestine, in the land of Israel. Israel was by now under Roman occupation. They were getting on with life, but every now and again there were insurrections. There were Jews who would rise up and uh, rebel against Roman authority. And one of them, by the way, was a man by the name of Joseph Ben-Gurion. Hold on to that name, Joseph Ben-Gurion. Uh, well, because of these insurrections, Rome had had enough. They say he's, uh, They said they were going to send their army, their entire army. So Vespasian and son, I think Nero, Titus, no, Titus, son Titus, led their army to uh, Israel, and they started right in the northern tip up in the Galilee area and worked their way down. It started in 60, May 67 AD and uh, you might remember the uh, 70 AD, 70, because that indeed was the year in which uh, Jerusalem itself and the temple were destroyed. But uh, a few held out in the south of the country at a place called Masada and uh, the Romans laid siege to this fortress up on a craggy hill and uh, in 74 AD they finally conquered it 
and uh, Israel was no more. In fact, Rome uh, eradicated every <coughs> mention of Israel from the land. They no longer called Jerusalem ruined Jerusalem. They no longer called it Jerusalem. They called it Alia Capitolonia. And the land, they called it Palestine, the land of the Philistines. Israel was in exile because of their disobedience and sin. They were under a curse. Well, they haven't returned, have they? In fact, it's in, been in our lifetime, your lifetime and mine, that we've seen a return from exile. When God does something, he does it properly. Yeah, that one uh, back in 722, well, 597 BC, that was a 70-year one. But uh, it didn't seem like Israel learned anything in particular. There is always a tendency to turn away from God rather than turn towards him. That's a discipline that requires all of our effort. But Israel didn't exert that effort. So for 36 jubilees, if you like, uh, Israel continued to be in exile among the nations. And uh, there they were in want, great want, as you know, the history of Israel scattered among the nations. Back in 1867, who would have thought? It's not something that, uh, that looms large on my list of geographical and historical dates. In fact, 1867, I think my hometown, South Bernard, was beginning to be settled by white settlers, but that's as far as I know. 1867 didn't seem to be anything significant at all. However, God had a remnant. And in fact, so many by now, that they decided to hold a conference in London in May, note that date, May 1867. It was May 67 AD that uh, Israel began to lose their inheritance. May 1867, Messianic Jews met in London to pray for their land and their people. God heard, hold on to that phrase too, God heard, but remember that God always deals with a remnant, and here we are sitting in this room today, the remnant who believe in God. Well, also in 1867, Mark Twain got on a sailing boat as a tourist. Foul-mouthed, agnostic Mark Twain got on a sailing boat and decided he would visit Palestine. And in fact, he wrote about Subsequent to his visit, he wrote about his visit in a book that he wrote called The Innocents Abroad. It was his bestseller all the time that Mark Twain was alive. And let me read from that book, just one paragraph again. Palestine, he writes, sits in sackcloth and ashes in 1867. Over it broods the spell of a curse that has withered its fields and fed it its energies where Sodom and Gomorrah reared their domes and towers, that solemn sea now floods the plain, in whose bitter waters no living thing exists, over whose waveless surface the blistering air hangs motionless and dead. Well, if you'd like to read the whole book, get it, The Innocents Abroad, I'm not going to read any more than that, but it's ironic that the words he used in that description fits exactly to what we read in Deuteronomy 29. Did you hold your finger in the page when we read chapter 28? I'm going to turn over to chapter 29 and read 22, verse 22, 23. It says this, Now the generation to come, um, I, you should read the context, but I'm not going to take the time to do that. Now, the generation to come, your sons who rise up after you, and a foreigner who comes from a distant land, when they see the plagues of the land and the diseases which the Lord has afflicted on it, will say, all its land is brimstone and salt, a burning waste, unsown and unproductive, and no grass grows on it like the overthrow of Sodom and Gomorrah, Admiral and Zebulun, 
which the Lord overthrew in his anger and in his wrath. Nations will say, why has the Lord done this to this land? Well, there you are. A stranger, you might have in your Bible, strangers, plural, but the Hebrew is singular, a foreigner, a stranger, will come from a distant land. It fits perfectly the visit of Mark Twain and the description of that next verse fits perfectly with his description as he saw it as an agnostic of the same land. Desolate, a burning wasteland. And uh, in, uh, uh, incidentally, every Sabbath day when Jews meet together all around the world, there is a portion of scripture that they read that day. And uh, ironically, those verses were the verses they read even in the synagogue of Jerusalem. Yes, there was a synagogue there. That day that Mark Twain set off to depart for his homeland, America. And on the way home, he wrote those words in uh, The Innocents Abroad. Deuteronomy 29, 22 and 23 seem to be poignant for that particular point in history. God is sovereign Lord after all. And his timing is perfect. Poor old Joseph had the language two more years in prison, but there was a reason for that under God. The cupbearer didn't know it, what it was. I wonder if he blamed himself ever, but uh, be that as it may. But Mark Twain, does anybody know what Mark Twain's real name was? Mark Twain was simply a pen name. Yes, I think I might have written Samuel Clemens. Samuel Clemens, that's right. And Samuel, we read in the book of Samuel, right in the very first chapter, that Samuel is a Hebrew word, or two Hebrew words, maybe E-L on the end means Elohim, and the, in front of it is the verb, he heard. In other words, Samuel means God has heard. God has heard his people in London at the conference and scattered all over the world, those who believe in him. God has heard them. And indeed, what does the word Clemens mean? It means mercy or merciful. God has heard and he is merciful. It's as if the name Samuel Clements was ordained to be born at the time he was born and then moved to Israel to report what he saw just for that time because at the same time that he visited Israel, so there was a British Army engineer who uh, was appointed to go to Jerusalem to dig up the ruins and remember that at this time it was Ottoman Empire Jerusalem and so I'm not sure that uh, they would have been particularly in favorable of this British army officer digging around in their territory but they forbade him, the uh, Turks have forbade him from going anywhere near the Temple Mount but uh, uh, Warren, Charles Warren thanks for his namesake Janet for giving us that book, that's great uh, I've enjoyed that. Fascinating read. Yes, uh, Warren dug up and measured the old city of Jerusalem. And in fact, before he was finished, he had done a, a survey of most of the old land of Israel. And he went back to England and wrote about his experiences, made a report, and he reported that he believed that if we train Jews in modern farming methods and get them to come back to Palestine, they could make it productive. He met Theodore Herschel and uh, explained his vision and so was born the Zionist movement. But if 1867 was a Jubilee year, when would the next Jubilee be? 50 years plus 1867 brings us to 1917. Now, uh, we have uh, the problem of World War I, and God used that to weave his perfect will through imperfect and in fact evil man's 
warmongering, so that by 1917, the Turks were getting more and more into trouble, the Brits were on the up now, and uh, in fact, uh, uh, General Allenby uh, decided to launch an offensive with the help of the Australian Light Horse, who a few days before had taken Beersheba uh, in the south, and now, not having had enough sleep after that onslaught, and not enough food or water even for their horses, they were asked to uh, ride on to Jerusalem. And if you look at your notes, I've quoted uh, a phrase from Isaiah chapter 31. I'm going to open my Bible at that uh, section. I did have a bookmark in it. I can't find my bookmark now. Uh, no, that's not it. All right. Uh, just hold on, because time is going to run out. Just hold on to that uh, phrase. Uh, As birds flying, the Lord will protect his capital. He will protect Israel. Is that what you've got? I've got I'm not reading from the notes that I've given you, but I think I might have quoted it in a little bit more detail there. Have I not? Yes. Thank you. Uh, so that's enough then. I don't need to say anything more. It seems to me that there was danger of Jerusalem once the Turks and the Germans who were their allies got wind that their defeat was imminent. They would have destroyed Jerusalem all over again. But the Brits were concerned that this was going to be the case and so they made sure that that wasn't going to uh, be the case. They, in fact, had their air force uh, strengthened and they were able to keep the German Air Force from flying. And so as birds flying, God protected his city. Interestingly, a lot of the soldiers and the airmen in that Air Force were carrying a portion of the Anglican prayer book. And in fact, on the last day of fighting, now every day there was to be a, a reading from the Anglican prayer book. And uh, on the last day of fighting, that verse from Isaiah 31, verse 5, was the verse for the day. So, uh, is that coincidence, or is God doing something here? What about uh, 50 years on, 1967? And you can hold your uh, Bibles open at uh, Isaiah 31 verse 5 where it says that uh, he was going to protect his prey or growl over his prey like a lion roaring. It's interesting because if you look at the names of the military personnel who were responsible for getting into the old city of Jerusalem, which was up until now still in Arab hands, their names all have something to do with lions. Lions roaring, a young lion, a lion cub. They entered, incidentally, via the lion gate. Is that coincidence? Or is God doing something? Well, that's not all, as you read uh, Khan's book, he often says, but there's more. And this is one of the mores. The trumpet, of course, it's a jubilee year, so as uh, the uh, chaplain, the army chaplain, marched in or rode in in a jeep with uh, his commanding officer, he had a horn as a chaplain. He would carry a ram's horn with him, or at least a borrowed one in this particular case. His name was Chaplain Shlomo Goren, and Goren means a threshing floor. Again, a little bit ironic because it was a threshing floor that King David had bought 2,000, 4,000 years, 3,000 years previously on which the temple should be built. Coincidence? Or has God got a sense of humor? Is he doing something special here? So, with that sort of sense of humor and that sense of